Good morning, everyone. Today is another episode of Ark's Trash. It is the eighth episode, and we have guest speaker King Kazuma with us. So as usual, Ark's Trash is an audio-only podcast. So just keep this video playing in the background, have it minimized, whatever you want to do. We're going to be talking a lot about the Ark's Council, as well as content creation versus streaming, YouTube versus Twitch, a lot of interesting things. But first of all, if you're new to the channel, I upload PSO2 content daily. So if you do play this game, I'd really appreciate to subscribe as it really helps out the channel. Anyway, without further ado, please enjoy the video. Welcome everyone to another episode of Ark's Trash. Today, we have guest speaker King Kazuma. Kazuma, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey, what's going on everybody? And thank you, Kuropi, for having me on your show today. Uh, my name is King Kazuma. I am a Twitch streamer who specializes in JRPGs and other variety games on Twitch. All right, perfect. So Kazuma, is there a reason or a history behind your name? Why is it spelled this way? Could you explain that? Okay, so long story short okay i went through a bit of an identity crisis uh, i used to be pretty big in the anime games community uh and then leaving that community i wanted to start something a little bit fresh like a name with no underscores or hashtags or numbers in it right mm -hmm. so i decided i said let me go make a new name so it went from kagami 5525 to kagami senpai with like pi actually spelled as pi it was very <laughs> weird um <laughs> the crisis part uh, and when I thought about it, uh, I wanted to take two of my passions and put them into one for a name. So you have one of my favorite video game series, which is Kingdom Hearts. Uh, and you have one of my favorite anime movies of all time, which is Summer Wars. So by taking the King Cosmo name from Summer Wars and flipping that first letter with an X, you kind of have both of my passions in one name and hence spread King Cosmo. Okay, gotcha. Okay, that explains a lot. But even though your name is spelt like that, it's still pronounced King Kazuma, correct? Yes. I do have a lot of people who call me Shin, Zing, Crossing, uh, everything under the Tuscan sun, but it is pronounced King Kazuma. So you said earlier that you used to do a, uh, a lot of anime stuff. So do you have like an, another channel that you used to cover anime stuff or were you a big content creator or something along those lines before you made your current YouTube channel as well as your current Twitch channel? So everything's kind of under the same history. I was never really one to believe in, you know, changing your channels or anything. Like I've never made like a secondary channel, um, but I was always just trying to figure out where my place was on Twitch. So. I have history with this channel specifically, like if you were to go back into data, uh, I've been streaming for about six years now, and it was weird, you know, starting off with Dragon Ball's universe being the first game I stream ever, uh, and everything since then has just been kind of me taking this journey from being a streamer. So everything's kind of all under one, it's all under one channel, but there have been different names and there have been different communities that have came into my channel since. So did you cover any fighting games or streamed any fighting games other than uh, what you just said, Dragon Ball Z, before PSO2? What other games did you cover? Uh, so in the past, I've covered Blaze Blue games. That was actually the first fighting game I've ever gotten decently good at. Um, from then, Dragon Ball Fighters, uh, Tekken, um, also things like Guilty Gear, and I've actually played Street Fighter, which was where my friends taught me to play fighting games. Because even though I was good at Blaze Blue, I never understood technical talk or anything like that, frame data. And my friends sat me in a Street Fighter Five game for about a year and literally kicked my butt every single day and told me what I did wrong until I got good. And that kind of bred the fighting game that you see now. You know, the guy who's like, hey, man, that's plus two on block. You know, it's just kind of <laughs> always using that fighter game lingo whenever I'm playing video games now. Because everything you see actually applies to other games, even frame data. Um, it applies to other games. So taking those basic fundamentals and applying that to other games is actually really helpful in me, you know, perfecting my skills as what I do with PSO. So here's a hot take question. What is your favorite fighting game? You can only pick one. Oh, uh, Virtua Fighter, Sega. Oh, okay, wow, that, oh. that's a classic. Yeah, that's like yes. my generation, but okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your so, favorite character in Virtua Fighter? Oh, Pi, absolutely. Damn, all right. I love her stance changes. It's just, you you go from a, a spin kick, and the next thing you know, your back is turned, the enemy thinks you're free, and then you just jab at him. It's, it's great. 
I love her stance changes. Do you think um, Dead or Alive took inspiration from that? Yes. Actually, yes. I believe Dead or Alive is pretty much a direct, I don't want to say a sequel, but a, I don't want to say copy and paste either, but it's it's more like a, a mirror to Virtual Fighter. Like, you know, it's that upgrade to Virtual Fighter that we never got, hence why we see some of those characters in Dead or Alive. Mm-hmm. Do you play Dead or Alive? I do, actually, and I main uh, Rig. Okay, okay, nice. I love my kicks. <laughs> I love my kicks. All right, so this is more of a question for myself, and that is, okay. if you were to compare Tekken versus Dead or Alive, which game do you prefer? I prefer Dead or Alive. Explain why. So coming from coming from some fundamentals like games of Virtua Fighter, uh, Dead or Alive proceeds itself to be more of a technical game, in my opinion. Now, that's not me saying that Tekken is not technical. I've seen Tekken. I know how crazy it can get, trust and believe. But I feel like with some things with Dead or Alive, it's more like there are more characters there that have a lot more complexity to how they're played. Whereas though Tekken, it's I've seen people pretty much opt away from using a lot of other characters versus like, I guess, some higher tier characters or whatever. And I, I got I tried to get into Tekken on my own, but it just never felt the same. You know, it never felt like I had that full control over my character like I've had in Dead or Alive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. So I personally I prefer Tekken over Dead or Alive, but I like Dead or Alive's system and I like the eye candy. Because the thing about Dead or Alive is obviously you've got the enhanced physics, which is very, very nice, yeah. you know, pleasing to the eyes. But you've also got a very simple to understand system of the whole strikes, blocks, and counters. Like this, I can wrap my head around very easily. And then with um, with Tekken, it's a lot more combo based. It's a lot more string based. You aerial someone and then you do a long ass combo and you end it. That's kind of my understanding of Tekken. But um, I feel the combo system in Tekken is just so rewarding when you finally get down like your 10 hit combo. And it's just like, wow, I actually did it. You know, that, that sense of fulfillment. I don't know. Maybe maybe I'm just dumb and I just don't. I've never learned a 10 hit combo on uh, DOA. But on DOA, I kind of just button mash because I'm there for the eye candy. That's totally fair. I, I won't even come at you for that one because that I, I specifically try my best to stop myself from playing as Ayane and uh, Kasumi because I'm just like, I'm not here to play. I'm here to just see these girls fight it out and look pretty. That's all. <laughs> yep, pr- and then pretty I just much. gotta force myself to play rig. <laughs> nice, nice. All right. <laughs> so uh, we got to come back to the podcast because I went on of a tangent there. But what inspired you to become a streamer or a content creator in the first place? Uh, so playing video games is always something I wanted to do for a living, and I'm still finding my own way. But when I was a kid, I was always good at video games. You know, I've been playing video games since I was three years old. Um, my first console was a Sega Genesis, and my first video game was Sonic the Hedgehog 3. Um, and dating back since, you know, when I was in high school and everything, I was always good at anime fighting games. I was playing all of the RPGs, Tales of series, Dragon Ball series, Naruto, and I just wanted to do this. But YouTube was never something I got into. Um, I never had the equipment. I didn't know where to begin. Coming up to PS4, I got my first PS4 on release, and I started playing video games on you know, just regular online play, and I figured I was pretty good at it. So me and my friend, we decided to get Dragon Ball Xenoverse early. It was about a week early. We paid some yen so we could get access to it. And when I first started, my friend was at work, and he wanted to see the game. So as I'm playing the game, and I'm pretty used to playing Japanese games. You know, I've played multiple Japanese games in the past, even though I don't necessarily understand characters. Pretty much have, like, the, I guess, sixth sense of playing video games in Japanese. So... While I'm showing him this game, uh, there's people coming into my chat. I didn't know what Twitch was. I had no idea. I was just like, this is a game. My friend wants to see it. And this is the only way to show him. So as I'm doing this thing and I'm talking to people and I'm sharing this connection or this passion for anime, video games, everything that I'm just a nerd about, I started to find a deeper love for Twitch. So through that entire week, I'm just like, dude, this is awesome. Like, this is Twitch. You know, I started meeting my friends, who I'm actually still friends with to this day, you know, six years going on. Um, My first stream ever, you know, I had like 1,200 views, and I got to really see what Twitch had to offer at that time. Now it's a little bit different, but it definitely did 
sparked something in me that made me want to become a content creator or a streamer if however you look at it so from what i understand you also have a full-time job and you're streaming pretty often how do you balance that it is rough um <laughs> coming home and being extremely tired from everything but it's it's one of those things where it's though you never look at it as i'm done working and then that's it you know i'm home and i'm just relaxing because that's how you put yourself in a in a ditch uh, the way that I cope with that is whenever I go to work, I bring a little black book with me and I write down ideas of things that I want to do on stream or when I get home or how I'm going to optimize my channel or anything that anything that pertains to progressing myself as a streamer. Um, and then when I get home, I start working on it. So when I'm done work, I'm not done work. I'm going to my next job and I'm only done work once that clock hits 10 p.m. and everything is done. And if it's not done, then I guess I'm working overtime. And it's not really something as treating your passion like a job. It's more of, you know, investing in your passion. And when you do that and you have no, I think one of the things that when I was little, I never did it as much as I should have because I always felt like there was people who were going to look at me the wrong way or look at me weird because like, oh, you're in the gaming, da, da, da. But when you go, you know, full force with it and you put your all into it, there's always this great feeling. So I want to keep that feeling when I'm constantly trying to push and advance my my channel, my content and who I am and how I present myself to other people. So balancing that out. Yeah, it's tough, but you have to go about it your own way, which my way is, you know, treating it the way I treat it. Mm -hmm. Actually, I want to bring up a reference, which uh, I listen to through Trash Taste. I don't know if you follow the podcast of Trash Taste. There were a bunch of anime content creators and they were comparing themselves on why they play games a certain way. So, for example, I play games very casually and there's a reason for that. While a lot of my Alliance members, they play the game very hardcore. And what they brought up was very eye-opening and it was because of your day job. So, for me, my day job is very office-oriented. I don't need to get up and like physically do things. But it's very mentally taxing while my other friends which are much more hardcore they have a very um i guess more physical intensive day job so they're not very stimulated like their brains aren't stimulated as much so when they come back home and when they play video games they want a challenge they want to be stimulated while in my case i'm mentally drained when i get home so i don't want to do anything i want to do the easy stuff i want to be you know i want to be that casual player with the auto play with the fast forward all that jazz mm -hmm. and so in your case since you have to play the game and create content at the same time where do you find that inspiration where do you find that energy to you know do your day job come back and still need to create content you know that's actually a really rough question to answer i can't really <laughs> i'm going to try to answer that one to the best of my ability but um you know i kind of just do it you know and, and i just do it you know i come home and i say okay in my black book let me open it up as soon as i open up my black book i look down all the stuff that i wrote down throughout the day and i say okay this is something that i want to work on for the week Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned one time in Arcs, uh, Arcs Hour, and I love that because that was a very good tip that you gave people was that you don't have to make videos every day. If you want to do that, you can't. You do not have to stream every day. Mm -hmm. But when yep. you do, you put 120% into what you do mm -hmm. and you take that time away so you can have some time to yourself. So um, how I come home to make that content is that, you know, I've been recently giving myself a little bit of a break because... PSO has been kind of draining, I'll be honest. But, you know, I come back and I'm just like, okay, this is what I want to do. I have my notes here. I have exactly what I want to work on. And it's it's about setting that standard for yourself. I mean, my tip for that answer is basically, you know, get a book, get a, you know, a whiteboard on your wall or something like that and plan it out for yourself. If it's something that you can't necessarily do on the fly, make a plan. And when you, ha when you come home and you, you take a minute to yourself and you look at that plan, you figure out how you're going to go about it. That way you always have something to do the next day. You know, you have yourself being organized. You know, this is a business as much as it's a passion, mm -hmm. um, especially when you are wanting to grow and, you know, make a career out of it. I do want to get into streaming, but I've, you know, I've always been more of a YouTuber. So now since I want to understand more about the streaming world, do you plan a specific topic for that day of streaming? 
or do you kind of just go in with like a general I, general direction on what you want to talk about or what you want to do on that day? So that's typically up to the chat, honestly. Um, I do tend to go in with an idea of what I want to talk about. Um, but depending on the vibe of the stream and how things are going, sometimes chat pulls a complete 180 and takes it to something else, you know? Um, and it's, it's good to see that because that means you have one, you have a chat that's very interested in what you have to say. Um, and you, what you say kind of means something to them that can breed a conversation. But honestly, um, that's about it. Honestly, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm trying to think of something I can say to like elaborate it just a little bit more. But no, that's it. You just kind of you kind of just go in. I mean, mm -hmm. some people, they have content that they want to put out in some games. So with streaming, it's easier. So you just have, oh, well, I'm doing Divide Quest today or Ultimate Quest today. And then some people are just like, oh, what are, what class are you playing today? But then in general, sometimes you can just answer those questions as you're streaming. You know, your chat will come through and make that conversation with you, especially if you have people there who are interested in what you have to say. That's actually a great point because I envy I envy you, Chrono Catastrophe, GM Custom. Like, I don't know how you guys are able to do it where you're focusing on the game, right? You're playing the game, but you're also paying attention to the chat and interacting with it. Like, for me, I, I don't have that multitask ability, right? For me, it's I'm 100% focused on the game or I'm 100% focused on the chat. And so whenever I'm addressing the chat, I'm either dead weight in a in an exploration or whatever expedition getting my ass whooped or i'm just sitting in the lobby and then there's a bunch of people that are not happy because i'm not doing anything and then there's the chat that is happy because i'm interacting with them and i'm just like how do i make all sides happy here like i can't find that balance because i've just never been never had to practice this you know i've never been in this situation so I really envy you guys how you can do all that at the same time. To speak on that one a little bit more, like, and that's very flattering coming from you, because <laughs> I feel as though I'm like, dude, the day you start streaming on, like, if you ever hop on Twitch because you're a community, you are going to see so much come your way. And I can definitely tell you it is okay. You're never going to please everyone. Um, some people may take it a little bit harsher. I've definitely seen throughout the community some people take being ignored. And it's not really being ignored. It's just there's so much plowing on the screen at one time, especially with the fast-paced games such as PSO2, mm -hmm. that it's it can hurt somebody when they feel as though they haven't been seen. Um, so one thing I tell streamers to do is always make sure you know you at least address your chat. Don't call them chat. Just say like you guys or whatever. Um, but make sure you address them. Say, hey, you know, I'm really focusing on the game right now. I'm sorry if I'm missing some chats. I'll definitely make sure that I go through, you know, read them later. Sometimes I do have to go through like 100 chats just to find what somebody else said. And if <laughs> and if I can't find it, then I'm, I'll say, hey, just repost it and I'll answer your question. Um, and I just try to make sure they know because it's one thing if they're just ignored and nothing said that can make them feel some way. But through a decent human being, you know, like you or me, if someone were to tell you, hey, man, if you send me that text again, I'll get back to it later, then they're going to get back to it later. You know, you have full faith in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So another question for you is about your stream or your, your audience. You call them king. Is that it? Is that is that your phrase for all your fans? Uh, yeah. Is there is there a story or history behind that? It is a sense of endearment. Um, man, woman. Uh, whatever you, you know, whatever you are. Um, I just say king, queen, even women can be king sometimes. I call my boss at work king all the time. Uh, she mm -hmm. loves it. And it's it's just like, it's a sense of endearment. And it's it's a way of, you know, it's a respective sense of endearment. You know, it's something that I picked up from a couple of friends who say it, and I just randomly started saying it one day. And I just, it felt good to say it, you know? It's looking at somebody who you respect to some point at a level, or to some point, excuse me, and you just say, hey, how you doing, King? Mm -hmm. And they'll smile. They'll legitimately smile and look at you and say, I'm doing good, man. How about yourself? And it's it's better than looking at a woman going down the street and saying, hey, baby doll, start catcalling. You know, mm -hmm. you respectfully look at her and you say, how you doing there, King? Or how you doing, Queen? Like, you can say however you want it, but it does have a certain approach to it that makes people feel like you are an approachable person to talk to. Okay, gotcha. The reason I, I brought this question up is because out of all the content creators I know, I think Azalera, he calls all his fans burbs. 
and the reason why he does that is because Burbs is like a baby bird. Like his whole alliance ranking system is based off name of birds. And that's why he calls all his viewers Burbs. And then, you know, that that's kind of history for his channel. And so I was just wondering, oh, since you call people king, is there like a progression system or like a history or some story behind it? Because I was thinking, okay, what's higher than king? You start calling people like, you know, Messiah or something. <laughs> <laughs> I do actually, I do say that to some people, like when uh, you have those that come in and um, like they, they try to educate you about the game. Mm -hmm. And I call them, you know, I'll call them God. Or I'll call them professor. Like, hey, thank you, professor. Thank you, God. No. I appreciate you for your knowledge today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Gotcha. Because I was actually thinking, like, uh, I've talked to Animana once or twice about this. And when you're doing YouTube, you get a lot of, like, recommended videos on, like, how to, how to be more interactive with your chat, how to be more interactive with your comment section, how to become a better content creator, blah, blah, blah. And there was one tip that always stuck with me, and that is like, think of a nickname for your fans, right? Like your your viewers, that you should call them something. Like how Azalera says, good morning, burbs, at the very beginning of every video. Like, I don't have that because I haven't thought of a nickname for my viewers yet. And it's very difficult, at least for me, I find it very difficult to think of a good nickname. And I think Animana's in the same boat. He doesn't call his viewers or his fans anything. He just kind of, you know, addresses them. I'm just kind of stuck at this boat thinking like, well, you know, if I were to call them something, what would I call them, right? There is actually this one streamer that I watch, and he is the guy that pretty much inspires how I reshape my entire content. And I've been watching him for years now. And if this helps, he has been streaming on Twitch for six, seven years now. I think he just had a seven year. Um and he actually does not have a single name for his chat uh pretty much he addresses his chat see there's there's one thing when you're calling people names to address everybody mm -hmm. there's another thing when you go into his chat and he'll say hi to a specific person and he will ask them something personally about their life mm -hmm. that is someone who has basically you know spent his years getting to know his community so it's it's not just you know calling him guild or calling him chat or calling him hey what's going on plebs how you doing today or you know my sandwiches you know it's it's just straight hey how you doing there game breaker 2000 like how is your kid doing you know how's the new house something like that and it's it, it built that establishment with them so though it is a good tip for those i would say for those who have a hard time remembering everybody you know until they get themselves established mm -hmm. it's also okay you know getting to know those people that come in every now and again and say hi and you know, i have this one guy in my chat who just got a house and he's been working ever since so whenever he does stop by i ask him how's the new house how is it treating you how's the family um and he doesn't even really like psl2 but he will stop by just to say hi and watch for a little bit and support and then go do his thing so speaking about pso2 like what got you into the pso2 to begin with so uh, back when PSO2 was pretty much just releasing, uh, me and my friend were looking for a bunch of MMOs to play, and we couldn't really get into any. You know, we went into Elsword, Vindictus, and everything. Uh, and there was nothing that really appealed to me, because the way PSO2 plays is very different. You know, it's more hands-on, optimal play style, where you have full control over your character. A lot of games are just built off of auto attack and whatever. So playing PSO was definitely something new. So I got into it when it first came out, uh, no beta testing or anything. And I was always playing on my friend's computer. So I liked the game. I didn't really know what to do with it, whatever. I stopped playing after a while. Uh, later on, it came out on PS4 a little bit after, I think, like the first year or two, if I'm not mistaken. And I had a Japanese account. So I decided, oh, I'm just going to play PSO2 again. I remember this game. It was a lot of fun. So I hop on and I start playing. Ever since then, I've been playing religiously. But it's been heck, you know, I mean, even just playing the game, I was so passionate about playing it. I would have like three screens in front of my face of like three different Wikipedia sites to help me through the game just to figure out what was going on <laughs> and reading <laughs> everything in Japanese and trying to, you know, figure out how the game loops so that I can just come in. And it got to a point where, you know, I was just like, hey, I'm here. But I have played other PSO or PS games in the past, just never PSU or PSO one. So uh, just for clarification for the podcast sake, uh, you were playing the Japanese version when it was originally released, correct? 
Yes. So basically, you've been playing PSO2 for eight years, I'd like to say, on give and off. Take. Yeah, give or take yeah. eight. Okay. Definitely on and off. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. So what's your favorite thing about PSO2? What, what gets you back into the game every time? Honestly, it's the combat. Like, no matter, no matter how you look at a game, um, the one thing that I feel will always be back is combat, especially from a fighting game perspective, you know? Um, everything will always be the same. I'll always come in and run the same quests. I'll always come in and do the same dailies, the same weeklies, whatever. That'll never change. But learning a class and trying to perfect a certain thing about it is always very interesting. And then even when you perfect it, you find more. You find more tech, you find more abilities, um, and you find more combos that either either people haven't thought about yet or haven't tried and you make it your own hence me playing with gunblade you know people didn't want to really deal with that so i decided to make it my own and that something like that definitely kept me playing pso mm -hmm. so i was watching or i guess i was listening to the uh oracle fleet your podcast right so i was listening yeah. to the episode with uh, azalera and you guys were talking about uh the history of the jp server and so I wanted to know, have you played every single class available in the game yet? Yes. Because I just recently started playing the second class because I've been playing Braver for eight months, nothing else but Braver. And now I have tried to learn a little bit about Etoile. The reason for that is because I've swapped from um, Braver Phantom to Braver Etoile. And so I needed to understand how Etoile worked. And so I did a little bit of the training and I played a little, I did a couple urgent quests with it. And I've realized that each class has a very different play style. Their pacing is very, very different. And since you've played every single class, what would you recommend beginners to play? That's a tough one. Uh, I would recommend three classes. Mm -hmm. Ranger, Hunter, and Etoile. Okay. Well, I mean, Etoile, they can't unlock yet till they're 75, right? On two classes. Well, yeah. Uh, so if we're going to take away from Scion classes, excuse me, uh, mm -hmm. if we're going to take away from Scion classes, Summoner. Is there a reason why you recommended Ranger, Hunter, and Summoner, specifically these three classes? So Ranger and Hunter, uh, specifically because those are two classes where you can definitely work at your own pace. Um, as far as people know, Hunter is a destructively dangerous class, yes, when played at a high tier. But Hunter is also perfectly built for beginners. Um, the thing about Ranger as well is that Ranger kind of gives you the ability to take your time and learn enemy attacks, learn placements and whatnot, to be able to sit back, still do a lot of damage, but then also learn the enemy as well. You're not forced to constantly press buttons like with Gunner. Plus, it's a pretty decent range class as well. Um, so something like that is very decent especially when you're someone who likes to scan your enemies and if you know that's like final fantasy term for you know just kind of getting it down like their attacks their patterns where should you be when they do this you can mm -hmm. watch it all from like 20 feet away yep. mm -hmm. that's how i actually learned some of the enemies in pso2 myself you know i would just take ranger and blast for a minute then once i learned it i would go to my next class and then i would fight them with my next class and in my head i would envision what would i do in that situation Hunter allows you to fight mobs, bosses, whatever, and get that same feeling, but you don't have to be long range. So you can pretty much do all the same things without being long range. Mm -hmm. And then the reason why I say Summoner is because Summoner is a class that plays outside of the normal spectrum of PSO2 classes, just like Scion classes, just a little bit different. So that's a class that I normally say either you're going to learn it when you start playing or you're going to have a pretty hard time trying to you know, remap your brain to learn it later on. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a class that I do recommend people play as a start if you're thinking, hmm, do I want to play Summoner? See if you like it first. Do you think that range classes in PSO2 have a tactical advantage over melee classes? Before the headshot damage got reduced, I would definitely say yes. And what about now, now it... on the live servers? Not okay. really. Okay. Okay. So the reason why I asked this question is because, so the first MMO that I've ever invested fully into was blade and soul i'm normally not an mmo player i've always been a very casual player i play mobile games i play uh i play shooters sometimes but i'm super duper casual when it comes to gaming and so when i went into blade and soul that was the first mmo where i went like super hardcore we did raiding i had a guild i, I was a raid leader all that junk right and it was very very stressful but, uh, you know, after I finished that phase, 
I was like, all right, we're moving on to PSO2. I'm not going to be that hardcore player anymore. I'm going to be a full out casual. And so I wanted to play a melee class because I saw Braver. And then back then, the only guides that I saw available on YouTube was, I think it was Azalera, I think it was Anamana, and I think it was Nos. I'm not 100%, but I think it was Nos. The consensus was, oh, if you're starting the game, Play either Braver or Bouncer because Dex Mag, you can equip all the weapons, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, perfect. I like Braver, Katana, Weeb, perfect. And so I picked up the Braver. And then I proceeded to get my ass whooped. And then recently, like, you know, just a couple months ago or like two months ago, I switched to Bow Braver. I've been learning Bow Braver. Okay, maybe not two months, maybe like a month ago because of Divide Quest. So in Divide Quest, I was getting absolutely destroyed with Katana because I couldn't reach some mobs, they would be flying around, and uh, I would just get pooped on. And this is when I run it solo. So I was like, you know what, I need a ranged weapon. And I was like, oh right, Braver always had a bow, huh? So I started to learn the bow. And now that I've learned how to use the bow properly with a 12 subclass, I'm like, wow! The game is like 10 times easier with range at least for me it is because back in blade and soul days i've always been a range character i played summoner in uh in blade and soul which is basically you have a literal summon like you have a cat that can taunt for you that can tank for you that does everything for you and you literally sit back and just like shoot flowers and throw shit at the enemies <laughs> i'm just like yeah this is great right and so i came from that type of play style to braver where like it's every frame matters and you have to like counter everything and i'm just like oh man i suck at braver huh and I, i've just sucked at all the melee classes i i played a little bit of hero i played a little bit of uh phantom katana phantom and i've just always sucked on all of them and then i went to bow braver and i was just like wow i'm dealing like three times more damage than my katana braver and it's so much less effort and that's why I came up with this question. Sorry, I was a little bit long-winded, but... Oh, no. You know, that's why I was asking you, like, since you've played all the classes, I I've always had the mentality that, wow, range classes are so much easier because you're out of harm's way. You can see everything. Like, especially that Shiva fight, like, the urgent quest, like, at range, you can see that counter crystal clear. But, oh, yeah. <laughs> but if you're in melee range, I don't see shit. I just see freaking flashing lights and big numbers. And then it's just like... Shing is like, oh crap, we're, we, we, we hit the counter, okay, we're all dead now, right? And I'm just like, no, I just enjoy using the bow so much more now that I can just stand back, relax, see everything. And it's just like, oh yeah, this is easy now. I think it's a, I think it's a mentality thing, really, you know? Um, when I'm playing melee classes, I've learned to listen out for sound cues more, because mm. I would see people use uh, Photon Blast in yeah. the middle of fighting Shiva, and I'm just like, why are we using Photon Blast? I can't see and she's just shrouded in this blue aura and the next thing you hear is this isn't even worth my time and i'm just like okay nope she's she's countering and mm -hmm. i can't see so i'm backing up whoever's dark blast is this good luck <laughs> <laughs> and i would just see like five people get countered and i'm just like yep knew it so it i think it's a learning curve you know however you look at it if you're someone who likes to see with sight if you're someone who likes to see with sound um if you're both you know then it's definitely helpful however you want to take it the only reason why i say like they're not as technically they don't take as much advantage anymore like they don't have a lot of technical advantage mm -hmm. it's just because the headshot damage is gone i'm thinking about it from a dps game gotcha right? okay but what you're thinking about is from you know how to take on enemies from a different angle mm -hmm. with that i will say yes they do they do carry a better technical advantage than other classes because with us with a sword it's just onga boonga on the weak spot mm -hmm. see with a rifle or any type of gun it's what angle can I hit you from so that I can be safe and still get my crit shot? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I need to know the history of Unga Bunga. Where did that come from? It's such a good phrase. You know, I don't know either. <laughs> I do not know either. It's just something people say when you just barrage, like you just go ballistic. Unga Bunga, just. <sighs> I think that word, at least for me, that word came from Crash Bandicoot. When you got the mask and became invincible, does doesn't doesn't he say unga bunga? Probably not. I think we're just thinking about it saying unga bunga because now I'm thinking about it saying unga bunga. Right. And I think I, it says unga bunga. I I, <laughs> I don't know because like 
Crash Bandicoot is like a childhood game for me back when I don't know when it came out. PlayStation One was it or? Oh yeah. Yeah, but oh that 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 brings back memories. Like that for me was a childhood game. I was like six, seven when I played that. It was good. It was a good game. Have you played four yet? Uh, no. Is that available on PlayStation Four or is that a PS Five only? PlayStation Four possible PC soon, and I will tell you, it is actually a nine out of ten game. It is not bad at all. I I will pick it up if it comes out on PC for sure, because uh I don't I I have a PS Four. But the PS4 drives me nuts because I have the very first generation of the PlayStation 4, and it is so slow that it just drives me insane, right? So I'm just like, no, I don't want to deal with that. I just want the PC version. Let it run off my SSD. Let my loading (laughs) screens be short. (laughs) I totally understand that. Trust me. Yeah. Um, Honestly, if you have the PC capabilities to play it, I would say wait for PC. Yeah, for sure. I, I'm I'm patient. I waited uh, Neo 2. I waited for that to come out on PC. And man, that game is punishing. I, I'm getting my butt kicked on that game so bad right now. Oh man, will you be picking up Ninja Gaiden? Oh, I don't know. Maybe. Uh, so you see, like I still go into these games with a casual mentality. And then I just die for like three days straight. And I'm like... Okay, I need to get good. I actually need to look at boss rotations and stuff. Because I don't like going into that mode very often. Because it's just like, man, it feels like I'm freaking working. I'm sweating bullets here for this game. It's just like, god damn it. <laughs> but it's so satisfying when you get the kill, though. It is. It is. It's that, oh, yeah, you do feel super rewarded when you kill it. It's like, oh, you know, all that hard work paid off. But it's so time consuming. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh all right so uh let's come back to uh to pso2 what's your most memorable moment in pso2 uh definitely the dance parties that we cannot have anymore because dmcas thank you oh gg man (laughs) speaking about dance parties do you know any content creators that makes amvs for pso2 uh not at all actually oddly enough yeah right i've always thought that was weird because, like, even Blade & Soul, right? Blade & Soul's not exactly a big game anymore, but we still have content creators that make, like, music videos from Blade & Soul. And that's why I was thinking, like, hey, you know, PSO2 is all about this fashion, you've got so many emotes, why hasn't anyone made an AMV? I'm just so confused, like, not even on the JP side. Or maybe there are, but I just I just haven't seen them. But I'm just confused on why no one's done this yet. Kurobi dance video incoming? No, that's <laughs> have you <laughs> my my editing is so crude and basic that there's no way I can put in a music video. There's <laughs> Honestly, I've never seen anybody really do much. I mean, I've made a couple of clips where I have my characters dancing to certain songs, but you know, never really thought about doing much with it you know one of the first things i ever did with pso2 was have like the sonic emote Mm -hmm. and then have my character running through the ruined city and i can't i angled the camera just right Mm -hmm. this is like a kind of really close up third person sonic the hedgehog spin dashing and it just has city escape playing in the background (laughs) and it was just really cute other than that never really thought to put a video together yeah i need more dance emotes (laughs) nice yeah man for sure like i've always thought it was weird that like most content creators at least on the global side you know we're very focused on information on guides on like all the technical aspects right i've just found it weird that no one's really gone more onto the fashion side since you know we have the whole joke and the whole common saying that hey fashion is the true end game who cares about guardian soul it's all about fashion right and so so i just found it really weird that there's no content revolving around this type of stuff about the fashion i was just like oh i thought about doing that i actually have it pinned on my wall as we speak Mm -hmm. uh but the problem with that was um and one one of the things i thought that would bite me back with it would be that you would then kind of take that creativity away from people and i think one of the good the good things that i like about pso2 is that when i walk into those doors there is not a single character that looks the same unless they planned it to be that way Mm mm-hmm and like i don't really have much male fashion either so that also stopped me <laughs> i pretty much only have female fashion so i'm like oh yeah here's my here's my cool female sets that are modeled after i did one that was modeled after fire force and 
it was Fire Force and Guilty Gear, mm-hmm. and it just looked great. But I wanted to do that one, and then I deleted the outfit because I was like making all these other outfits. I literally have a spreadsheet of sets that I've made throughout the year of PSO2 up to about like I think it's about sixty outfits now. I'm yes. not addicted. You are actually speaking about addiction. How many hours of uh, PSO2 do you play a day on average? Now it's becoming less. Uh, but when PSO2 first came out, it was about twelve to fourteen hours a day. I wasn't working at the time, so I was okay. Just going yeah, in. You, you you scared me for a second there. I was like twelve hours plus eight hours of work that equals four hours of sleep. I was like, wait a second. <laughs> Bold of you to assume that I sleep. Yeah, that's that's intense. This is a question for myself because. Uh, from what I see, you seem to be very well connected with a lot of these gaming companies. So, especially with Sega. So, is there a story behind this? Yeah. Um, so, actually, Sega is very new to me. Okay, so how Sega is split up is there's the PSO team, but then there's like Sega Europe, then there's Sega America, then there's Sega Japan. And they're all like their own separate thing. Mm-hmm. So there's a slight chance that they don't even know each other <laughs> from what it seems. Mm-hmm. Um, but there was actually, from playing PSO2, I went into Sega stream, and it's normally Sega of Europe streaming on that Twitch page. So I went in there, and because of my connection with PSO's Sega team, the moderator and the Europe team knew me. He's like, oh, that's the PSO guy. And I was just like, oh, Hi. <laughs> wow <laughs> like I, I just came here to watch the puyo puyo that's all i was just saying hi i donated a little bit and then i you know i left um and with that that kind of i guess it kind of built that bridge because then i added you know i added the people that i saw there on twitter and one of the biggest things i tell people is you know when it comes to stuff like that and again this is a business as much as it is a passion and when you want to grow you want to make the, you want to build those bridges not as someone who wants to take those opportunities to leech off, but someone who wants to take those opportunities to grow. So I, each person that was in that stream, I actually ended up following them each on Twitter. Um, and recently, I can say with things like uh, Persona 5 Strikers, I made a bridge. I built a bridge with one of those devs, and she gave me the email to another dev, hence building another bridge. <laughs> mm-hmm. And she gave me a code for Persona 5 Strikers and basically let me do reviews on it. So it's things like that. You know, you build those bridges by shooting that shot and, you know, talking with these companies. The thing is, a lot of these devs are on Twitter and they're looking for content creators with even the slightest bit of community to walk up to them and say, I want to promote your game for you. Doesn't matter how big you are. Doesn't matter how small you are. You matter, you know, and you definitely matter to them. So if a company can give you a game, for some free publicity they will do it and the only thing you have to do is you have to show your stuff you have to show that company why you're worth investing in and when you do that you build that bridge that lasts for your career as a content creator um so that's how i've been building myself i've been talking with those people um you know i have connects with koei tecmo ben anamco square enix and i've been you know, constantly trying to make a bigger report for myself as I grow through the years. And this has all been within the two years of streaming. Wow. Let's take a step back. And I want to know your, the beginning, the beginning of how you got your first connection and then how you built off that. Would you mind sharing that with us? Uh, started with Koei Tecmo, creating that exposure for yourself. I mean, even something, the, the slightest little tweet about the game. Uh, they gain some sort of traction or saying that you love the game or talking about it in some way, uh, you kind of bring that attention to you. You know, when you tweet out to these uh, companies, there is a community manager that runs those Twitter pages. So they'll see it on their own personal or they'll see it on the company site. Mm -hmm. And I forgot what game it was that I was playing. Uh, Actually, I do know it was Samurai Warriors or Warriors Orochi, one of the two. Mm -hmm. And I was talking about it because I love warrior games. I'm like, oh, I love the hack and slash and I love the stories and the character designs and everything. And I started talking about Warriors Orochi. Next thing you know, there's a code in my inbox saying, here's a free Warriors Orochi code. Tell me how you like the game. And I built that connection with the guy behind the account. And now, you know, I follow his personal account. He follows me. And, you know, it's been this thing where, like, he'll come into streams and now he watches me play other games. Mm-hmm. But if something like Neo 2, you know, came out, he gave me a Neo 2 code. 
um, fairy tale. And these are games that I'm just like, dude, thank you. I love these games. And then I will play them, you know, and I'll talk about them. I will review. I'll tell them if there's like any problems with it or whatever, so that they can go back and fix it. So when it comes out, it's in working condition. Mm-hmm. You know, some mm-hmm. things you will have to follow embargoes. You won't be able to stream. You know, you won't be able to make videos on it, but you'll be able to play it and you'll be able to talk on a professional level with set dev or whatever and kind of, again, make that name for yourself. And now whenever a game comes out, if I put in a request for it or if I ask him, you know, I have his direct email or Mm -hmm. I have his direct Twitter message or his DMs and you kind of go from there. Same has been for Square Enix. You know, Uh, this guy I actually met from a friend. (laughs) <laughs> and we did this thing on Fridays where we would drink beers and talk and sit in the chat. And it became more of a, you know, he works for Sega. He can definitely help you out. But then it became like a friend thing. So I look out for him. You know, I have his personal Twitter. We talk and everything. I mean, I say it's Square Enix. Mm-hmm. And it became a friend thing. So you're not doing it as a way to, like I said, sneak your way in. Yes, you're building those bridges. But you want to be genuine. You know, you want to be you. You're making friends not only with a person who just happens to work for a video game company, but you're making friends with a person mm-hmm. and a person who will, you know, help you build your career as you help them build theirs nonetheless, because what you do impacts them as well as community managers. Mm-hmm. So from what I understand, you were able to do all of this through Twitter. Is there any other platform you used or is it just pretty much exclusively Twitter? Twitter and Twitch. That's about it. Gotcha. So as you may or may not know, I am an absolute boomer when it comes to Twitter. I have no idea how to use this platform. And I don't know if you noticed, but when the arcs hour, you know, when they, they at me or they, they mentioned me and so people could find my Twitter account, like that Twitter account isn't actually like I don't have an official Twitter account. This Twitter account's just my personal one. And the thing about it was I was following a lot of... um let's say, uh, cultural content, a lot of very, very, uh, artsy people. Oh. And, um, <laughs> so I, I was like, I had like a mini breakdown going like, oh crap, Sega just at me and, um, people are following me now, but you know, everything that I follow is like not safe for work. So I was like, oh, I, I think I need to unfollow these guys just to keep things safe, you know? <laughs> That is actually a huge downside. I cannot tell you how much I feel you because, okay, so my Twitter is actually my personal Twitter. Mm -hmm. I do not have a secondary Twitter or anything, but I am also a person who likes to speak my mind, whether it's against a company, for a company, however I see it, I speak my mind. I try not to be disrespectful, but I also try to be honest. Mm -hmm. And that may lose me a lot of followers, but I don't care. You know, my integrity is the most important thing. So... When I say things, people tend to look at me and they're like, dude, this company is looking at you. What are you doing? Or, you know, when I like something, uh, hence those contents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those things. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, and I like it. Just the support, you know, because I support. Mm -hmm. I don't look at it. I don't have an account, but I do support my friends who do it. Mm -hmm. But that does show up on my likes. And then when I see that person scrolling down, I'm just like, oh, yeah, don't look at my stuff. Just mute me. Just mute me. You don't want to see what I like. Just keep, keep going. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah it's definitely not pg-13 <laughs> like I- i've definitely like i i never really used twitter till recently because honestly i i don't actually know what the platform's used for right the i've seen the bad and the ugly of twitter i haven't seen like the positivity part of twitter yet and so for me it's just kind of like minding my own business staying in my own little bubble and I've just kind of, you know, oh, look, there's a nice piece of artwork of like some Genshin Impact or some PSO2 and some stuff. And I'll like retweet that. Um, there was recently there was a um, there was a person who played on the JP server that made um, cosplay models of all of the um, the Hollow Life girls. And they were really good replicas. I was just like, wow. So I retweeted that and a lot of people liked it. But like. I, I don't know what's the point of Twitter. Like, I don't really understand it. Could you explain it to me? Uh, to be honest with you, me neither. It is, it is nothing but a way to, for me to express myself um, and to also connect with other streamers and or companies. That is all I use it for. Uh, okay. I don't really have any content that I put on Twitter. 
I wake up in the morning, I speak my mind about something, you know, I add somebody when I need a question or when I need to talk about something or I at a company when I need to tell them this was an amazing game or, hey, I have a problem with this game, you know, and other than that, that is the only way I get a direct, you know, answer from mm-hmm. either people or companies. And I like that. I like having that direct answer or that direct way to get in contact with people and someone or something. That way I know that, you know, when I want to make moves or I want to do something, I know exactly where to go. Just one platform. I don't need to send 15 emails. I don't need to have a friend who has a friend who has a friend and then wait for it. Mm -hmm. I can just immediately send it through Twitter and it's all right there. Gotcha. All right. All right. So, uh, while we're still on the topic of, uh, I guess, content creators or content, um, are there any creators that you follow for PSO2 specifically? Uh, pretty much everyone in Arts Council. Not everyone, but I do tend to, because I don't want to, you know, blow up my follow page. God, I can't tell you how many notifications I get from people who aren't in PSO2. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> pretty much anyone who, if I come into your channel and I'm watching, always look for certain things um, because... I like to invest support in people who want to or who have that ambition to push. Um, And you don't have to have it for me to follow. You know, I'll even follow friends who don't really care about it. But specifically, you know, from someone who is doing something like this and looking for other people doing stuff like this, I'm looking for someone when I come into your chat, I'm able to chill, just relax and just watch. I say nothing in your chat. Hey, I'll watch uh, people streams all the time. I have five tabs up as we speak right now. And no one knows that I'm there. I'm just watching and supporting. Um, and, you know, I follow people like Chrono, Cami, Anamana, Friday Witch, Honey Jar, uh, Elite, uh, W Glint, uh, GM Custom, uh, Ima Kuni, and more and more. And I'll just watch and support. And I will actually message them on the side because I don't want people to ever think, like, I'm cloud chasing. So I'll message them on the side and ask them, how's their day going? I was in your stream. How are you doing? Stuff like that. Just check on them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how many of these content creators have you actually reached out to? Like, the just, you know, not the ones that you listed, but just the ones in ARCS Council. I'm going to give you my point of view first so that you can see where I'm coming from, right? So I... I'm scared shitless, right? When I when I reached out to Azalera, I was sweating bullets because I've never talked to the guy, I've only seen his videos, and like, you know, mad respect, right? And so I was sweating bullets when I reached out to him. I was like, hey, I- I've got this uh, podcast idea. You know, I don't know if you're interested, but it would be awesome if you can be on the show. And he, you know, he was really, really nice about it. He was just like, yeah, no problem. And, you know, we just we just started recording. And it's very similar with you. It's where the podcast was the first time where we actually had like a serious sit down in depth conversation. And so like, for example, in your case, I don't know much about your personality other than what I've seen on the Oracle fleet and what I've seen from your streams. And so I know that there are certain content creators which when they're on a show or when they're live, they put on a persona or they put on a personality. And when we're on a podcast or when I'm talking to them, like, you know, uh, not in a recording situation, they might act differently. And that scares the shit out of me because I'm very simple. I, what you see on camera is what, what I am in real life. Right. And so I don't expand my circle very much, even though I'm in ARCS Council and I see all of these creators, I'm too scared to reach out to any of the creators unless they've been vouched for. So like I would talk to Anamana, I'd talk to Chrono, I'd talk to Black to Basics, and I'll be like, hey, what do you think about this guy? What do you think about that guy? And if they're like, oh yeah, he's cool, then I would be like, all right. So I'd have more incentive to reach out to people and be like, yo, you, you want to do something together? And other than that, if people are like, oh, no, that guy's a dick or that guy's, you know, not very nice, I would be like, okay, maybe I don't want to collab with them or maybe I won't even approach them. So, like, how do you get the the courage to just be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to reach out to everyone and talk to everyone? Aren't you afraid of any backlash or any, like, association with someone that's, you know, doesn't have the best rep, stuff like that, that might damage your image? Um... Not at all. It goes back to the whole it's a business and a passion sort of thing. 
You know, Mm -hmm. on a passionate side, if I hear something bad about a streamer, I'm thinking, I mean, I'm not going to deny that something did happen. You know, I have nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. But then again, I have nothing to do with that. So if if I were to go talk to somebody and I would say, oh, yeah, how do you feel about this streamer? Me me and Anamana have had this talk. You know, we've actually sat down and we've went through everybody in Arts Council and, you know, because we didn't know everybody. But me and him knew everybody separately. Mm -hmm. So we kind of went through and we talked about each streamer that was there and, you know, what they do, how their content is. Um, And that's that's a fact, you know, and I know somebody's probably thinking, well, what did they say that was bad about someone? Don't think negative about it. Think about it as we want to know who we're investing our time into, you know. And when you're doing something like this in Kuropi, I was very happy when you messaged me because I was like, dang, you actually see me as someone investing into it. And I'm sorry about yesterday because actually that's a work thing that I had to take care of. But, you know, it's it's something where you are very appreciative of people taking that time to do something like this with you. And for the Arts Council thing, it was something that I started up because I wanted what you feel about meeting up with other streamers. I wanted to completely destroy that barrier that's what this was for this was so people can see those content creators who have that ambition who have that want to grow and be able to talk to them and build that bridge together without feeling like someone's going to leech try to take from them and do everything but grow with them and that's what i wanted to do for arts council and that's why it is what it is now reaching out to those people was basically kind of me taking that hit for everyone in a way it's like yeah if we see a couple snakes which we've had we have had but as you can see that's nothing that you know we talk about it's just kind of they're gone that's it i don't like drama and honestly i believe in the code of moving silence so if we're all growing and someone is trying to stop that growth if someone is trying to stop your money my money Adamana's money chrono's money then i'm going to kick them and it's because at the end of the day i want your that barrier you have as you are a good person to be gone. I want you to feel free to message anybody and say, I want to collab. And as long as you have that content creator tab under your name, you are good for it. They'll look at you and they'll say, you know what? Let's do it. Mm -hmm. Because you want to build that bridge. You want to build yourself and you want to build your content. And I don't want anybody to take that away from you. Now I have a better understanding of the ARCS Council. To be perfectly honest with you, I have no idea what the ARCS Council did before you just told me right now. So I just kind of got invited into this through, I think it was Anamana that did it. And I just kind of joined and I had no idea what I what I joined, right? I was just like, oh, it's a Discord. And so it's very nice to actually now get the full story and understand what exactly we do here on ARCS Council. Oh yeah, and it's weird because it's it's conversations that typically streamers do not have. I have these conversations a lot with my chat. Um, but it is conversations that sh- typically streamers just don't have because you don't want to be seen as a person who's treating it like you're all about the money. And it's like, I'm not. But at the same time, though, I want people to know that I'm serious about what I do. And I want people to know that you're serious about what you do. So mm-hmm. when we're adding people, we're adding people because we see that they're at least putting in some sort of work and they want to do something with it. Whether you decide to work with them or not, is completely on you. But now you have that network to build that bridge. While we're still on the topic on uh, content creation and content creators, what advice do you have for small content creators that are starting up? Or maybe they don't even have a Twitch channel or a YouTube channel yet, but they've been inspired by your stream or my videos and they want to come into content creation. What advice would you give them? Shoot your shot and be 100% about every step you take. Because a lot of things that people don't do, and I have a habit of doing it myself. So trust me, I know what it feels like and I know where it comes from. And it's the thing of just not doing it. And as much as you tell people, I'm grinding, I'm grinding. It's more than just turning on your stream, hitting, you know, start stream and just grinding. You know, when you're done, there's things you must do. There are forms you must fill out. You know, when you're dealing with Twitch, you got to like your W2 form when you get affiliated and whatnot. However you choose to go about it. Um, there are things you have to do, building your stream, how you want to establish yourself into your channel so that your passion can reflect onto whoever comes into your stream and see you. You know, you are your brand and your brand is your influence. So when I say is, when I say shoot your shot, if you have a company you want to talk to, if you have a game you want to play, you play that game and you make sure you have the most genuine mindset of all time. You know, you're playing it because your heart is set on playing it. You're talking to this company because you want to. The best they can tell you is no. 
And the best that'll happen is that you'll get no views. You'll get no subscribers or followers or however you want to think about it. But you're already at zero. So if you get one today, it's a win. And it doesn't matter if you're at one view. It doesn't matter if you're at 100. It doesn't matter if you're at 1,000. You matter. As a streamer and as a creator, as a YouTuber, you matter. So you only end up not making it when you don't put in the work. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... You know, in in today's podcast specifically, I want to provide some uh, some advice and some rich content for aspiring content creators. And I think it's a great idea that I can give advice on the YouTube side of things and you can give advice on the Twitch side of things since you've had a lot more experience on Twitch. So for me, I will say that if you are aspiring to become a YouTuber, then it's as King Kazuma said, it's about getting the content out there first less about you know worry less about what companies are going to think about you worry less about how many views you get but just focus on doing the best you can with what you have right now and uploading a video and then as i said before in the arcs hour it's about consistency it doesn't mean you have to do daily uploads but you you know you have to have some sort of schedule whether it's one time a month you know three times a month once a week you need some sort of consistency so people know that hey this channel actually uploads every single whatever you know there, there's some sort of schedule to it and so they will subscribe to it actually a lot of people don't actually subscribe they just come back every couple days when your video comes up they just look up your name and they search for your channel but they don't hit the subscribe button till much much later like in my case, a lot of viewers watch four of my videos before hitting the subscribe button. And so I was I was thinking like on the Twitch side of things, uh, Cosmo, what advice would you give people if they are just starting out on Twitch? You know, as you said earlier, some people try to put out a mask when they're live. Don't mm -hmm. do that. Be mm -hmm. yourself, show your passion, speak your passion and speak your heart. And also one of the most important things that I am still learning myself, I'll say, is be consistent. You know, just as Kuropi said, um, you know, you want to make sure that you have some sort of a schedule. Uh, you never know what will happen. You know, you'll have a community one minute and because they some people don't just automatically hit the follow button. They'll just come back to the game and see you. You know, they mm -hmm. will never know if you're live. So you need to be consistent enough to give that person a reason of why they want to follow you. And when they do then you start building that, you know, you don't even know it's happening, but then you start building that relationship with them. Um, and you never know what's happening until you start to see like that one person reoccurring just starts coming back. And you're just like, oh yeah, you hit the follow button a while ago. It's like, I've been watching you for a while, but I never followed, but I love your content. So I'm going to follow you now. And now I'm going to come back every day, you mm -hmm. know, and it's something that you don't expect to happen, but it does. And the thing about streaming and YouTube is YouTube, you know, you never know if anyone's watching you. Mm -hmm. But in streaming or on Twitch or whatever platform you're on, you never know who is watching you right now. You never know who you're making an, who you're making an impression on. You could be making an impression on a CEO of a company, a dev of a company. Uh, you could be making an impression on another streamer who's never seen your show before. Uh, a partner who's never seen you before and now they want to invest in you. And that goes for a regular person who wants to invest their time in you. So that's pretty much my tips on streaming. <laughs> All right, perfect. <laughs> well, that's going to wrap up today's episode of uh, Arcs Trash. So I'm going to open the floor to uh, King Cosma in case you want to plug any of your socials or do any shout outs. The floor is yours now. Absolutely. Uh, I do try to stream every day, but you can catch up with all of my streaming updates on Twitter at twitter.com slash King Cosma. And to catch me live, you can always follow me on Twitch slash King Cosma, not with a K, but with an X. All right, perfect. As usual, all of King Cosma's socials will be linked in the description below. So you guys can just check him out there in case uh, you're audio only, you know, just come back to the video and just click on the link. But uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for today's episode. Thank you for joining me, King Hazama. Thank you for having me, man. I really do appreciate you taking the time today. And that concludes the eighth episode of Arcs Trash. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, I would appreciate a like and a subscribe. And I'll see you guys in tomorrow's video. Bye. What can I say except you're welcome?